welcome to those of you who have just joined us. My name is Lauren, my pronouns are she, her, and I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. While you may be joining us from all over the world, today we are here in London, Ontario. We acknowledge the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and the Tanunktin Nations, whose traditional lands we are gathered upon today. So welcome. We're so excited to have you here for our Medical Science Night. Now, before I go through the itinerary for tonight, let's go through just a couple of housekeeping items. First, we have enabled the live closed captioning for this webinar. If you'd like to turn it on, you'll find the live transcript button on the bottom bar, and then you can choose show subtitle. A box will appear and you can put it wherever you would like on your screen. The other option is to choose view full transcript and a transcript will pop up in the sidebar. But please remember, this is live closed captioning, so unfortunately I can't guarantee the accuracy. Next, your audio and video will remain off, but that doesn't mean we won't be interacting together. We will have polls throughout the event and we wanna be able to answer all of your questions. You can submit a question using the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. You can enter questions now or whenever you think of them. I'm joined by lots of friends from Western tonight, staff, faculty, students, and we will do our absolute best to answer your questions as they come up. We're also gonna choose some of those common questions and answer them all together live at the end. So what's happening tonight? Here you go. <laughs> We're gonna start with a welcome and a program overview from Dr. Brad Urquhart, our Associate Dean, Basic Medical Sciences Undergraduate Education, and Dr. Sarah smith Perriard, the Manager of Basic Medical Sciences Undergraduate Education, who will both give you a program overview, including how to choose your courses in first year and how to enter your favorite module in your third year. Following that will be a sample lecture from Dr. Anita Woods, Undergraduate Chair and Associate Professor of Physiology and Pharmacology in the BMS UE on caffeine and its effects on the human body. After that, we're gonna let our students take over for a panel to tell you what it's really like to be at Western. And then lastly, we'll all join together at the end to answer some questions live. We hope that you'll join us for the entire evening, but if you can't, no worries. We will be posting a re uh, recording to our website in just a few short days. I do wanna remind you that we have lots of other presentations available for you to sign up for or to view. We have our next Next Steps presentation coming up on May 26th, and you can sign up for that or watch the recording once it's been posted to our website. This is a really helpful presentation for everyone who's looking to understand what it is they need to do before they come to Western. We also have presentations about other faculties, residents, and student experience that you can check out. It's all done through the exact same webpage you used to sign up for this presentation, welcome.uwo.ca slash presentations. Now, before we kick off, we want to know a little bit about you. So in just a minute, you'll see a poll appear on your screen. And our first question is, where are you tuning in from tonight? All right, a couple more seconds here. All right, so it looks like we've got quite a few of you tuning in from somewhere else in Ontario, but otherwise it's a pretty good split amongst the remaining three. My next question, just because I'm curious, is what are you most excited for when you start university? Meeting professors, making new friends, residents, moving to a new city, learning new things, research opportunities. Probably should have included an all of the above option. Oh, well. All right, just a couple more seconds here. Okay, so it looks like a lot of you are really excited to make some new friends and learn some new things, which I think is great. That's a big part of what university is all about. Okay, well, that's it for me for a moment. Uh, now I would like to introduce Dr. Brad Urquhart, our Associate Dean, Basic Medical Sciences Undergraduate Education within the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry to kick things off and welcome you to the evening with medical science.
Good evening, everybody, and welcome. It's such a pleasure to welcome you to, to this event, highlighting the, the basic medical science undergrad education programs. Um, and it's really my pleasure to, to show this first picture. This is, this is a picture of our beautiful campus. And if you haven't been able to check it out yet, I, I really hope you get a chance to. Lots of uh, green grass and lots of open space and lots of great um, outside of the classroom things for, for you to do. So, so let's get talking a little bit about, about where we are and sort of what you're here to decide. So, so you have a big decision to make. There are 21 excellent universities in Ontario alone. And of course you have the option to go out of province. And you're obviously here because you have some interest in the, the medical sciences program at Western. And there's probably a couple things that are influencing your decision right now. Um, one might be the size of the university. So, you know, there are massive universities. The University of Toronto has 60 to 65,000 undergraduate students. There are smaller universities like Laurentian, Trent University that have fewer students. And then there's Western, we sit kind of in the middle. We're, we're what you would consider a large and research intensive university. So we have about between 25 and 30,000 undergraduate students. We're similar size to McMaster University. And we are a research intensive university and that comes with some real benefits, I think. And, and one of those benefits, of course, is that you're getting some of the world's experts in the medical sciences, both in basic medical sciences and sort of the clinical aspect of medical sciences. So there certainly are some advantages to, to being at a bigger university. Um, you also have to think if you're looking at medical sciences, not every one of these 21 universities is going to be um, for you. Not everyone has a, a, a medical sciences program or, or an equivalent, but we recognize that there are a lot of other universities that do have this program. We started this way back in 2001 and it's been an enormous success and we're, we're building and evolving the program as we move on through time to, to sort of um, go through student needs. The one thing that shouldn't be in your mind in terms of of making your decision is tuition because it's largely the same no matter um, which university you select. So you should be selecting the university that's the best fit for you. So let's talk a little bit about what medical sciences is. So, so you're interested in studying medical sciences. Well, medical sciences is the study of the human body. We look at how the human body works. How does our, how do our organs work? How does our heart beat? How does our, you know, how do our lungs allow us to exchange air how does our brain function for us to recognize our surroundings? So we focus on how the body works. And then of course, we're also interested in disease. So what goes wrong when people have diseases? What goes wrong in these normal processes when people have diseases? And that leads us to interventions. We of course wanna improve human health and understanding how the body works in the normal situation, what goes wrong in disease allows us to, to come up with really novel interventions in terms of treating um, diseases. And in the medical sciences, we focus, we have a lot of different departments that focus on different areas. And you can see them in front of you on the screen. Tons of different opportunities for students, anatomy and cell biology, biochemistry, epidemiology and biostatistics. And, and I don't have to read the whole list. You can specialize in each of these, these programs to, to look at medical sciences through that specific lens. And we recognize that that's, that's a, quite a mouthful and a decision for students to make. And a lot of students you know, have a more broader interest in the medical sciences. And, and for that reason, we've established a really successful interdisciplinary medical sciences program that allows students to take courses from a lot of these different areas and, and look at the medical sciences through an interdisciplinary lens. So, you know, the large research intensive university comes with the benefits of having, you know, the world experts at the university and lots of great research um, opportunities. But having said that, we also have a real focus on making sure that you're getting the best possible education in your field. And, and we have several award winning instructor, instructors, some of which are, are shown on the screen, who really come up with really novel ways to teach students. One example in the top left is, is the program director for the Interdisciplinary Medical Sciences Program, Dr. Nicole Campbell, who's designed a lot of interactive and team activities in her laboratory classes, such as, you've probably heard of the concept of an escape room. Uh, you know, this is like a social event where you go somewhere and you're in a room with, with a bunch of your friends and you have to work together as a team to try and get out of the room by answering a set of clues. And Dr. Campbell's put this into her interdisciplinary medical sciences classes. 
for students to work together to, to work on these sort of escape boxes where students work together in teams to answer some medical science based questions to sort of get into the box and, and answer the clues. So it's, I think, really um, ground breaking technology that our instructors put into um, in, into their into their teaching. I'm now going to pass it off to my colleague, Dr. Sarah Smith Perriard, who's going to take you through a, a few other things about her program. Thank you so much, Dr. Earhart. So what does a BMSC degree look like? Well, to start, BMSC stands for the Bachelor of Medical Sciences. In the BMSC, you will be completing either a four-year bachelor degree or a four-year honors bachelor degree. The BMSC is a joint program offered by the Faculty of Science and the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry. Now, as a BMSC student, your learning will be a combination of research-based and experiential learning. With over 20 honors specialization modules or course combinations that lead to graduation with a four-year honors bachelor degree, your time here at Western is very customizable. Now, who determines what you're studying or interested in? And that would be you. It all depends on the area of research that you are wanting to pursue. Seeing as we're still in the application part of your journey, let's take a look at what happens once you receive an offer of admission. So if you receive an offer of admission to the medical sciences, you have been earmarked as a student who will be guaranteed admission to the BMSC program in year three. This is assuming that you have satisfied all of the assured admission conditions. But what does this mean? Well, from a course perspective, your first two years are within the Faculty of Science. So you will be taking the same courses as your friends who were accepted into the Bachelor of Science program. But your behind the scenes label will be listing you as a MedSci 1 and MedSci 2 student. So you complete your first two years taking the required courses. And in three years from now, so September of 2024, you officially become a year three BMSC student, where you will then complete your final two years in the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry. So let's back up a bit and make sure we talk about another route to get into the BMSC program. Say you have received an offer of admission to the Bachelor of Science, but you would really love to join the BMSC group. To help illustrate this, let's take a look at this flowchart, which helps explain the two different paths that can be taken to get into the BMSC program. If you are not in Medical Sciences first entry, then you can still apply to the BMSC program in year three. You would have to get 60% in each of the first year courses in biology, chemistry, math, and physics, and in each of the 2000 level courses required in year two for the module that you want. You also have to satisfy certain conditions, including an average of at least 75% on these 2000 level courses. If you are admitted to year three BMSC from the competitive pool, then you are considered for admission to the module or modules that you requested. Now, this is after the students in MedSci 2 who have satisfied their conditions for assured admission have been placed. To date, the students in MedSci 2 who satisfied the conditions for assured admission have not filled up all of the spots in Year 3 BMSC, and we have been able to admit all of the qualified students to Year 3 BMSC who have applied from the competitive pool. Now, this could change in any given year, depending on the number of students applying to Year 3 BMSC. If we have more students applying than available spots, admission to year three BMSC from the competitive pool could actually become competitive and require an average greater than 75% on the second year courses. But to date, those who have been qualified have been accepted into the program in year three. To find all of the modules that are offered in the basic medical sciences, I would suggest you take a look at the academic calendar. It is a wealth of information. Okay, so now let's go to, to some of the most common questions that we get. So one of the most common questions that we receive is, can a BMSC degree lead to med school? And the answer is, of, of course, yes, it can. And there's, you'll see shortly that there's lots of students that, that follow this path. The next common question we get is, is the BMSC program a pre-med program? And the answer to that is no, it's not a, a pre-med program. And in fact, Canada does not have pre-med programs. Now, what I will say is that students that tend to want to follow this health professional degree tend to be drawn to the BMSC program at Western. 
Um, and, and this is kind of obvious in that students that are interested in medical school or even dental school have an interest in human health and disease and, and helping people in that light. So, so they do tend to fall, um, come, come to this program for those reasons. Now, really, when, when you're selecting your university and your program of study and what you want to do, the best way to be successful is to make sure that you absolutely choose the program that you love and that you're engaged and interested in. If you choose something that you love and you're passionate about, it's going to be easy for you to study. It's going to be easy for you to do well. So if human health and disease is sort of your driving passion, then the BMSC program is likely something that's of interest to you. So now let's get on to what do graduates do with their degree. So of course, you're coming to university to have success. You're coming to set up your, your career goal. And of course, we're very interested and excited about your career goals as well and want to help you get there. And every year, we're very interested in, in where our graduates go. So every year, we send out a survey to our graduates, and we get a pretty good response rate, um, over 70%. And I believe last year, it was 71% of our graduating class responded to the survey. And this slide every single year is one that makes us really, really proud because we see, you know, where our graduates go. And, and what we tend to see is, is a lot of students going on to further education. And, and this is, this makes us very proud because they're going on to education in positions where they're going to be leaders in healthcare um, or, or industry or academia. So if you look at the slide in the upper right quadrant, 27% of the, of the graduates respondents from last year went on to medical school, 2% went on to dental school, and 7% went on to other professional programs. And these would include things like optometry and pharmacy and other programs like that. So that's a very large fraction of our class that's going on to further training that they're gonna become leaders in healthcare professions, various different healthcare professions, and if you look at sort of the bottom slice of the pie in yellow, 37% 30 of our graduates went on to graduate studies. So these are degrees doing a master's or a PhD degree, setting our, our graduates up to be leaders in industry or even go on to academic careers. And don't worry, if further education is not sort of part of your, your goal, of course, there are students that go on to have great success um, working in, in industry and other areas like government, which is shown in the upper left quadrant in green. So, so lots of great successes from our, from our trainees. So you're, you're probably here to, to sort of get some of your questions answered, but also maybe you're sort of on the fence about why choose medical sciences. And hopefully we can go through a, a few things about our program that, that we think are really great. Um, one of them that I think is really great is the, the opportunities for experiential learning. And we're consistently evolving and evaluating these and trying to expand them. So you'll note when you go through the BMSC program that a lot of the laboratory courses that you take in your upper years are not just cookbook lab courses where it's not like your, your grandmother's chocolate chip cookie recipe where you're adding a little bit of flour, a little bit of sugar, a whole lot of chocolate chips. And, and some butter and baking it, it's making you come up, work in teams, work together, come up with the design of the experiment, the hypothesis that you want to test. So it, it's more than just following the recipe. It's thinking about, about how to do it and, and then actually doing it and, and going on to analyze the data. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for students to work, work together and, and, and figure out new things. Many of our programs have in, in the honors thesis stream have a research project in the fourth year. And this is an especially exciting opportunity in the program. This is where you're, you're removed from the classroom and you work in a faculty member's lab to, to work on a real life medical research problem that people don't know the answer to. Aside being from being the associate dean of this program, I'm also one of the professors in the program and I take students on a yearly basis into my lab to answer questions about why patients respond differently to medications. And it's such a great opportunity to work with, with bright young minds to, to put new perspectives to these problems. And, and my current student this year was working on why people that are taking certain anti-cancer medications go on to develop kidney injury and trying to figure out why some have kidney injury and others don't. And he's done a tremendous job in sort of unraveling um, this mystery that's gonna lead to, to a publication. And I don't want to give you the impression that every student gets a publication, but, but several of our students do. Another thing that we're really working on the, in the experiential learning realm is 
other opportunities outside of the research lab. And there are a number now of what we call community engaged learning courses in fourth year for, for students to do. And these are for students that, that want to tackle a real life problem in the community. So they partner up, they work in groups and they partner up with, with somebody, some organization in the community to work on a real life problem that the organization is having. So this could be something like the Alzheimer's Society needing help with a, a real life problem and they're a volunteer based organization and they don't have the resources to tackle that problem. So students are, are recruited to help tackle this project. They work in small groups to really make an impact and seeing the excitement of the students when they come to present these projects at the end of the year is, is, is really inspiring. Another area we will touch upon tonight is the summer research opportunities. So if you're interested in working on a special project with a faculty member, as Dr. Urquhart was talking about, but looking at over the summer as an opportunity, we have competitions available that will support your project and pay for 16 weeks of summer employment from May to August. These, in, these competitions are an incredible opportunity to work closely with one of our phenomenal faculty members, as well as gain hands-on lab experience. And a bonus is that winning one of these prestigious awards looks very impressive on your CV. So it truly is a win-win situation. And I'd like to finish up just by talking a little bit about um, the program and the opportunities for breadth and depth. And I think that's another really strong part of the program is, is you can sort of tailor it to, to your interests. Um, there are some students that are really focused on the cellular and molecular, the really microscopic details that, that make up human health and disease. And they really can, can tailor their degree to focus largely on molecular and cellular processes and really focus in on those processes. Other students are more focused in on, on the big, bigger picture, the systems level or what happens with each organ. And by the time you get to fourth year, if you're really interested in the brain or the heart, you can take a lot of classes that focus on different aspects of the brain or different aspects that focus on the heart. So really the ability to, to study breadth and depth. And of course, if, if studying you know, um, anatomy and cell biology is of interest to you, but you just can't give up everything else. I did mention at the beginning that th there's that interdisciplinary medical sciences program that allows you to take a, a broader, more interdisciplinary look at studying medical sciences. And I did mention at the beginning that we're also evolving our program as we move through to, to keep up with science and, and some exciting changes I think that are happening for next year based on feedback that we've heard from, from current students is the opportunity to take some, some options in your first year. So starting in September of 2022, so, so you're entering year, um, former, former students or current students had to take a full year of physics. And some students indicated that they really, with today's science, they really wanted to get more of a background in, in programming in computer science to, to sort of tailor to their ability to, to look at big data later on in the program. And that's being introduced as an option now in first year where you'll take physics in first semester and then you'll have the option if you want to take the second half of physics or if you want to take an introductory computer science course. So I think that's an exciting change that um, from what we hear a lot of students are excited about. Some students just, just like the physics and will stay with it, but others are excited for the computer science option. And the other thing that we've been hearing a lot from, from students is that they, they don't know enough about the options within medical science in the program early enough in the degree because it's it's focused in the faculty of science and it's getting you those core science skills that you really need to be successful in medical sciences. So for next year we're, we're um, introducing the opportunity to explore the medical sciences to get a, to get the opportunity to, to see each of the different disciplines within the basic medical sciences to sort of help you chart your path to get you that information a little bit earlier in your degree and help you decide whether you want to do microbiology and immunology or epidemiology and biostatistics to give you sort of that that program level detail so those are some a couple of exciting things so with that i'll thank you and that's it for our presentation for now and we'll hand it back to lauren thank you so much to both doctors urquhart and uh, Dr. Smith-Perriard. I hope that our audience has learned a lot from all of that information. 
Um, it does look like questions are coming in fast and furiously. So do remember that if you haven't asked something yet, please make sure that you are typing those questions into the Q&A box so that we can either answer them now or live at the end. Um, but I'd like to shake things up again with another couple of polls. So my first one here is, after all of that information, what subject area of the BMSC interests you most? Just give that a couple of seconds here. All right. Just give it a couple more seconds and we'll end that off here. So it looks like probably most of you are looking at either physiology and pharmacology or anatomy and cell biology, but it looks like there's a good spread amongst all of those different options. So that's fantastic. My last poll for the evening is what makes you most excited for medical science? Is it that research, um, lab work opportunities, maybe that specialty in third year, meeting your professors, internships? Probably also include, should have included an all of the above option, but lesson learned here. All right. Just give it a few more seconds. So looks like the majority of you are really excited about that specialty in third year, but also looks like research and lab work and internships are very close options. But, but sadly, nobody's really looking too much forward to meeting their professors. So I don't know, hopefully we can change some minds with that. All right. I am going to move on to our next thing, which is our introduction to our mini lecture with Dr. Anita Woods, our undergraduate chair for the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology. And she is presenting a lecture titled, The Effects of Caffeine, Friend or Foe. Coffee, one of my favorite things. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Woods and I'm here to tell you about caffeine, one of the major compounds in coffee and other foods and beverages, and what we know it does to the human body. There's also one major misconception that I want to break down for you today so that you can feel just a little bit better about that coffee that you're drinking in the morning or in the afternoon or maybe right before bed. Caffeine is a compound known as a stimulant. And this naturally occurring drug that we eat or drink has effects on multiple organ systems. We know that caffeine affects the nervous system, increasing alertness. We also know that caffeine has an effect on the cardiovascular system, increasing blood pressure and heart rate. So if you feel any palpitations, maybe just a little bit too much coffee. And we know that it has effect on the digestive tract. The stomach and the small intestine are made up of smooth muscle and that smooth muscle responds to the caffeine and they become overactive, causing more contractions of that digestive system, which will increase motility. You've probably also heard that caffeine increases urine production and actually an imbalance of urine production where you would feel dehydrated. But we know now that this isn't actually true. It's a misconception. Caffeine is not what we call a diuretic, and you've maybe heard that term before. Diuretics are either compounds that we've made or naturally occurring compounds that increases urine production. Increases urine production more than should occur naturally, such that you produce more urine and you are imbalanced with your water in your body and become dehydrated, and that doesn't feel very good. Caffeine isn't actually a diuretic it doesn't actually leave you dehydrated. There's no imbalance of water left in your body if you ingest something that has caffeine in it. Let's look at the organ system briefly responsible for producing urine, and that's our kidneys. The blood that travels through your body will pass through the kidneys, and as that blood goes through the kidneys, it is filtered and it is processed. And what the kidney decides to keep will go back to the blood and anything that the kidney thinks is in excess or shouldn't be there will be excreted out of your body as urine product. 
Now, in order to do this, we have these little structural units called nephrons. Nephrons are the actual part of the kidney that does the job of filtering the blood and then producing a urine product after it's made the decisions of what to keep and what to excrete. If you're dehydrated, our body releases a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. And this hormone's job is to, instead of producing more urine, you produce less. So as that fluid is traveling through the tube, that blood that was filtered, the water that's there, you don't want to get rid of it. The kidneys want to save it because your body is already dehydrated. So it saves the water. And the reason it can do that is because of this hormone called antidiuretic hormone. That hormone can tell the kidney to save the water and then produce less urine. So when we talk about diuretics, we're talking about situations or compounds which affect this process. So when we're talking about caffeine, we now know that caffeine does not affect antidiuretic hormone and does not affect this part of the nephron, which is responsible for balancing out the water in your body. But what does caffeine do? Have you ever gone on a road trip and maybe regretted the fact that you did drink a cup of coffee right before you hit the road? I have. Well, what's happening? So when you drink a cup of coffee, the kidneys are unaffected. They do the same thing as if you drank an extra cup of water. But the caffeine will act on the bladder. And what it does to the bladder is it causes it to become overactive. So you still produce the same volume of urine, but you just feel like you have to go to the bathroom a whole lot sooner because your bladder will start to contract even before it's filling up. So it makes you feel like it's probably dehydrating you, but it's not. So I might not recommend a cup of coffee for a long road trip, but I absolutely recommend that it's okay to drink it in the morning as part of your daily fluid intake. Doesn't dehydrate you, just makes you run to the bathroom just a little bit sooner. I hope you all enjoyed that mini lecture. I know I have definitely felt a few different things resonate um, the first time I watched that. Anyways, now I would like to welcome our students to our video call. So if I could ask uh, Samdarsh, Madison, Anya, Lori, Anish, Emily, and Aiden to uh, turn on their cameras and unmute themselves. So welcome. Thank you for joining us today. These are all current Western students in our medical science program. So I'd like to begin with some introductions. So students, if you would let me know, please, uh, your specialty within the medical science or your intended specialty, if, if you're not quite in third year yet, um, what uh, year you're in and also where you are from originally. Um, Aiden, you're first on my screen. Would you like to begin? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Aiden. Um, I am doing an honor specialization in epidemiology and biostatistics. I just finished my third year of the medical sciences program, and my hometown is Richmond Hill, Ontario. All right, next on my screen is Anish. Would you like to go? Hi, everyone. My name is Anish. I just finished my third year, and I'm going into my fourth year of the medical sciences program. Um, I'm currently in a double major for physiology and IMS, and my current hometown is Mississauga. Excellent. Uh, Lori, you're next on my screen. Would you like to go? Hi, everyone. My name's Lori. I just finished my second year in medical sciences, and I ITR'd for One Health, um, and that module is kind of, uh, you know, not many people really know of it or have heard about it, but it's essentially a really great mix of um, everything that kind of gets into human health. So pathology, study of disease, epidemiology, environmental factors, all these sorts of cool things. And I'm from Mississauga. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Sam Darsh, you're next on my screen. Would you like to go? Yeah, for sure. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Sam Darsh. Um, my program is Physiology and IMS. And just like Lori and Anish, I'm also from Mississauga. Okay. Next up, Maddie. 
Hey guys, uh, my name is Maddie. Um, my program technically is officially called Biochemistry of Infection and Immunity, but I just put uh, biochem uh, and microM on my screen just to make it a little bit easier. So it sits within the biochem department, but it is a collab module between biochem uh, and the microM department. And I'm originally from Kitchener. Fantastic. And Emily, please. Hi, everyone. I'm just making sure you can hear me all right. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm Emily. I actually just finished my fourth year in the honors specialization for IMS. I did a minor in dance as well, and I will be coming back to Western for my master's in physiology and pharmacology in the fall. And I'm from Waterloo. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so my first question for all of you, um, if you want to raise your hand or if you want to just go ahead and answer, uh, I'm pretty flexible with that. But would you mind letting me know what your favorite science or medical science course you've taken so far has been? Uh, it looks like Lori, you had your hand up first. So we'll start with you. So my favorite um, med side course I think I've taken is in my second year, uh, microimmunology, um, which kind of discusses, um, you know, disease vectors, um, different things like bacteria and viruses. Um, I really enjoyed that. I didn't ITR that because I felt like I, I learned a lot from that course, but it was a great course. And I also really liked in my first year, the second um, part of physics. So now that you have that option to take it or computer science, I really loved physics in second semester, but yeah. Okay. Uh, Maddie, do you want to go? Yeah, so um, my favorite course that I've taken probably within my program um, would be a, a third year biochemistry class. Uh, the course code's 3382, but what it basically is, is uh, protein dynamics, and that's taught by Dr. McLaughlin, who's a prof that you'll have uh, in second year if you enter into the med sci program. Uh, he just does a really good job of setting up the course in a way that makes you actually learn something from it and take something from it aside from memorization. So he really makes his lectures focus on critical thinking. And at first, when you get into the course, it seems very unique and foreign, but once you get to the end, you really take a step back and realize how much you learn from it, separate from anything you learn about proteins. That's kind of just the subject you're studying, not really what you take from it. So I really like that class. That's fantastic. Uh, Sam Darsh, would you like to go? Yeah, for sure. So my favorite is um, Phys 3120. Doc, uh, it's actually taught by multiple instructors, which is kind of like why I love the course because it kind of breaks down, it's a year long course that breaks down the human body in the various systems. And so for each system, they get like a, a like a fabulous professor to come in and teach the course. And it kind of, uh, it, it keeps you on your toes. It's really fun too. So that's my favorite course. Okay. Uh, Aiden, would you like to go now? Yeah, sure. So my favorite course so far was one that I took this year. Um, it's a third year course in epidemiology. It's called um, Epidemiology of Major Diseases. And um, the reason I like this course was because basically every week or every two weeks, we would talk about a new disease and we talk about kind of the global burden of the disease, what that means for public health systems around the world, um, some of these symptoms. Um, so like clinical presentation of diseases, treatments, prevention, stuff like that. So kind of the epidemiological perspective of various diseases. And every disease, we had like a new professor come in that was an expert in their field, of course. So it was really interesting and kind of similar to what Sam Darsh was talking about with his course. It kind of kept it on, kept us on our toes, but also it was kind of nice to hear about experts um, in different fields. That sounds fascinating, not gonna lie. Um, Anish, would you like to go? Sure. So I'll actually have to agree with Sam on this one. Um, my favorite course this past year was also Physiology 3120. It, like Sam kind of said, it, it encompasses pretty much the entire human body and you cover like um, different parts of the body and like a different series of lectures and each professor comes in an expert in whatever uh, part of the human body that we're learning and they teach us this um, human body, uh, this part of the human body in depth. I really enjoy the course just because of um, one, the professors were great because they were clearly experts in what they were teaching. And second, I really liked like the application style of it. It wasn't just simple like regurgitation of facts. You're actually forced to like understand the concepts and like kind of apply it in a way that like you wouldn't normally think like if a system went wrong, how does that affect the other systems? It's kind of like a chain effect. So I, I really like that aspect of the course. You guys are really selling med sci students. <laughs> Um, okay, my next question is, uh, what are you hoping to do after the BMSC? But I'm going to make this a two-part question, and I'm wondering, has that changed from what you wanted to do when you entered into the BMSC? So again, if you just want to raise your hands, and we'll start with that. Okay, wow, coming in fast and furious. Emily, would you like to begin? 
Sure. I think I gave a bit of an introduction to what I'm doing after my BMSC, but I'm going back for a master's. I like Western so much, I decided to come back. Um, and quite honestly, that was not at all on my radar when I came in to MedSci in first year. I was thinking I was going to go, you know, undergrad, med school, and into the workforce. And I think, especially with um, the pandemic and just being in the academic setting, I found that that was where I really thrived and where I enjoyed being. And I wanted to do more research. I wanted to have my own projects and be able to really be involved in the scientific process. And I think having a master's is, you know, a great thing if you want to apply to med school later on, but it also isn't the only thing you can do. You can also go into a PhD program, go into potentially teaching. Um, and I think that's something that's really interesting and keeps a lot of avenues open for me. And I'm really excited to see if my plans change in two years from now. I think that's a good takeaway that med school, even though that was your, your, your original goal, still hasn't, uh, it's, it's still an option for you if you decide to pursue that a little bit later on. I think that's fantastic. Uh, Maddie, would you like to go? Yeah, so I think a little bit differently than a lot of other kids who enter med sci, I didn't initially start off thinking I wanted to go to medical school. I actually didn't even really know for sure what I wanted to do. Um, I had thought about doing uh, law school or some other kind of professional school, but I knew that in high school, my strengths kind of uh, were in science. So when I saw the med sci program and I came to events like this and just kind of saw the breadth of different things that you could take, I just thought it was a good option because it had so many different avenues. And then I kind of ended up stumbling into wanting to go to medical school organically after being in the program for a little bit, which is why I say it's a bit different because most people pick it because they want to go to med school in a lot of cases. Um, but I think after being in the courses and talking to some students who have either gone to medical school or are pursuing it and just learning how to critically think and realize that I like medical sciences so much, it made me realize that the only thing that seems to be appropriate for me is medical school. So I think it was kind of a nice thing that I kind of fell into it in kind of a happy accident that I could have gone to any other life science or any other program and maybe gone somewhere else, like maybe law school or something that I had originally planned. But to kind of come to medical school naturally, which is where a lot of med sci kids start, was kind of interesting. So that's how mine changed. I appreciate that perspective. Thank you. Uh, Lori, would you like to go? Yeah, um, I guess mine is actually a mix of both Emily and Maddie's answers. Um, I initially chose this program because I had uh, wanted to combine my love for science with a, a law degree because I wanted to kind of go into health law or something similar to that. I, I was open minded, but I, that was kind of where I'm heading. Um, and then throughout my time over the last two years, I fell in love with the courses. Um, the people that I met also really influenced my desire to go out and problem solve and figure out new things related to science. Um, and then through the last two years, kind of just stumbling upon these different courses and kind of being able to explore all the options within medical sciences. And now being excited for my next um, two years in my ITR, my module, I decided to see where that leads me. And that has, again, influenced me to also be interested in medicine organically um, through these all these different influences, my courses, the people that I've stumbled upon, people I've worked with um, in different labs, the professors I've spoken to. And so um, I think that's a great uh, kind of aspect about this program is that there's so many different factors that lead you to um, choose whatever postgraduate path you take. And for me, that just so happened to be um, medicine and that's what I'm pursuing now, but that could also change, who knows, in the next couple of years. And so, yeah, that's kind of where I'm headed right now. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I guess that kind of leads really nicely into my next question, which is how did you choose your honor specialization or your specialty heading into third year? All right, Lori, did you still have it? Okay, there we go. Okay, I didn't do it. Did you want to begin with that? Perfect, thank you. Yeah, sure. I actually had an interesting story. Um, when I first started medical science, I, I really liked physics in high school and I really liked it in first year as well, which is an un unpopular take. Um, but I really thought I was going to do medical biophysics. And then I got into the, I in second year, I took the second year physics requirement and I realized that it wasn't necessarily what I was um, hoping that it would be. Um, but at the same time, I'd also taken a statistics course, which all of you will, um, hopefully when you enter the medical sciences program. And that along with the second year introductory epidemiology course kind of opened my eyes to the world of epidemiology. Um, and that along with the COVID-19 pandemic really kind of fueled my passion and helped me discover that I was passionate about epidemiology. And that's kind of what led me to where I am now. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Uh, Sam Darsh, would you like to go? Yeah, so for me, it was a combination of courses I took in second year and talking to students from upper years that kind of um, guided me towards making the decision for phys and IMS. 
Um, the courses I took were primarily there was FIS 2130, which is a year long course. It's very similar to FIS 3120, which is also a FIS, like year long FIS course. And kind of a, it, it solidified my interest in studying the entire human physiology. Um, plus talking to upper year students, it's really helpful because they've gone through the processes that you have and they kind of have the insights. So I was able to, you know, figure out my different options and then come to a decision. And so that's kind of my process. I appreciate that you reached out to upper year students for advice. Uh, Lori, would you like to go? Yeah, so um, for me, I really tried to explore real life applications um, before I chose my, my module. And so for me, after my first year, I, um, aside from all the amazing research programs that Western has to offer, I feel you'll find a lot of people in the program will also send cold emails to other professors or different principal investigators for research. And so that's what I did after my first year. And I ended up working um, at the Center for Global Child Health um, at SickKids. And that is essentially the entire reason why I, I'm so interested in the One Health module. It's because it it really opened up my eyes to tying in epidemiology with pathology, with the study of disease, with um, socio and economic factors that tie into health and especially global health. Um, and it just really stirred up my passion for um, creating or trying to think and analyze critically about the real world and how that affects human health. Um, and I think the One Health module essentially ties all those aspects together. I mean, you're studying scientific courses as well as things that are outside of our realm of science, things like sociology, things like um, environmental sciences. Um, and so I think that's kind of just what drew me in is how holistic it is and how really it ties to real life applications that people don't really think about when you think of human health. Um, and, and that's the whole reason why I, I chose to do that. Sounds like you've got like your perfect little package wrapped up in a bow. Uh, Maddie, would you like to go? Yeah, so um, anybody on this call that knows me uh, separately from this knows that I talk constantly about biochemistry and microbiology, immunology, the whole nine. Um, and I think I kind of, again, came into it because my first semester and second year, I just happened to get placed in a spot for the microbiology 2500 course in first semester. So for those of you that are incoming to Western, uh, usually the courses that you take in um, first semester, for a lot of my friends, I've seen a similar trend where they kind of help inform the module choice you end up making because you get to finish them before you actually ITR and decide what you want to go into. So I had taken uh, biochemistry, which happens in first semester as well with microbiology. And I really liked both of them together. And the second year that I took these was in the thick of COVID last year. So none of these course components were online. So I found a huge discriminating factor for me were which courses I really liked and was encouraged to work on on my own time that I really, really liked. And it was always biochemistry and micro for me. And at first I thought I was going to have to pick between the two. And I ended up actually kind of like uh, Sam mentioned, I ended up uh, reaching out to some students and talking about how ways that I could combine them together. And I ended up having a phone call with a prof uh, who encouraged me to look into the uh, biochem of I, I program, because it just means that you take uh, prereqs from uh, both modules. So you kind of graduate uh, with an honor specialization in both without necessarily having to do like a double major, one in each thing. Um, and in third year, it was the best decision I could have ever made. Um, it honestly just feels like I was meant to be in the program because every course that I take just shows me something new that makes me ask 10 more questions. So kind of the long and short of it, I ended up coming to it because I loved uh, both courses in second year, online environment where it was hard to be interested in things sometimes. Uh, and then they're talking to upper years and profs, they really encouraged me to go for the program. Awesome, thank you. Um, I do have a question from one of our participants that I'm gonna read to you. So I hope, hopefully you guys will be able to answer this for me. Um, what is your take on residents and food choices and which residents, if you lived on campus, uh, did you stay at and, and did you like that experience? Emily, would you like to begin? Sure. I, I absolutely <clears throat> love my first year residence experience. I can't speak highly enough about it. I was in Ontario Hall. I will rave about the food all day I still miss like the butter tarts they were oh insane um yeah I think what drew me to Ohal aside from the reputation for really good food was the hybrid style I knew I wanted some elements of the traditional residence but I also wanted a bit more space I didn't want to share a bathroom with the whole floor so that's kind of what drew me to the hybrid style and I think Ohal ended up being like it was a little further, I will say, uh, than some of the what most med Thai kids would do, but I think it was totally worth it. And um, yeah, the butter tarts. Oh my gosh, I'm hungry now <laughs> just thinking about them. They're fantastic. I'm going to have to try those butter tarts. You're really selling them. 
Uh, Sam Darsh, would you like to go? Yeah, so I lived in medicine in, um, in my first year. And at first, it wasn't a, a residence that I particularly looked into. It was actually, I ranked it fourth for myself. And when I got it, I'm like, I was very confused. I'm like, oh, which res is this? But it was a pleasant surprise. It's very homey as like a, as a personal history, a personal culture. It's very old. And um, the, the positive thing about meds is because, you know, if you're in science, it's super close to all the science buildings. It's right across the bridge. So I've been able to catch a 430 lab when I've slept. So like 425 napping. So that's very convenient. Um, it also has pretty decent food options. Um, they stay open pretty late till 10 p.m. So you have kids from Elgin actually come to the Medsid Cafe as well. And um, they have a really solid sandwich bar. So that's what I have to say about Medsid. Sandwich bar, hey, I'm gonna have to check that out. Uh, Anish, would you like to go please? Yeah, so like Sam, I was also in Medsid and I really enjoy the residence, like honestly for kind of the same reasons. It kind of has like a history behind it. And, the building itself is a really unique design and like um my floor in first year i thought was really great i got to meet some amazing people both in my program and outside of my program so it was like a great experience just to like getting to know everyone and like i thought the the social atmosphere was also really great just everyone was willing to talk and get to know each other so i think that's the one advantage of like a traditional style residence is that more people are willing to interact with each other um i would say in terms of making a decision figure out like what your kind of like your priorities are and what you kind of what you kind of like so like a traditional style residence i thought personally was a bit more social you get to talk to more people a hybrid style residence um like oh for example um those ones have like really nice rooms it's a great it's a great place to live i think it, it's definitely one of the nicer residences that are at western and then like your suite styles are more like secluded you have more of your privacy so it's like it's kind of what you value and like what you want to see, like what, what you want out of a residence and based on that, you should make a decision. Fantastic. And you actually segued really nicely into my next question, which is great. Um, what are some of the ways that you have all become involved on campus? Is it through clubs, sports, part-time jobs, residence council? What, what kind of things do you guys do, folks do? Lori, do you want to begin for me? Yeah, sure. So um, quite a few of us are on the Science Student Council. Um, we have the whole executive team here. Um, and so I love the Science Student Council. I mean, I've been on the last two years and it's brought me so many different experiences and friendships and um, just things that I think everyone here on this call should get involved with when they um, get into university. Just taking that first step to try something new um, and meet different people. And then you end up discovering what you love. And for me, that was um, student council getting involved. I'm going to be the vice president, or sorry, I almost said academic, that's Maddie. I'm going to be the vice president programming next year. And so I get to continue what I love doing, which is planning events for the science faculty. Um, and aside from that, I'm also on the Dragon Boat team at Western. Um, it's technically the Dragon Boat club team. We have a summer roster, but it's not the same thing as a varsity team. Um, and I love that. It's so much fun being on the water in the summer. Um, it's very tiring. Um, and I've always been really someone who's interested in sports and fitness. Um, and so for me, being on the water in the summer is just a win-win situation. Um, but you'll find that at Western, there's tons of different things. I mean, I didn't even know the Dragon Boat team was a thing until you talk to friends, talk to upper years, you just look at the websites. Um, you know, we also have a club's fair and a team's fair um, during the, I think, early September. And so you just get to explore and then whatever you enjoy, you can continue doing for the rest of your academic career. Awesome. Tra dragon boating. Did not know that that was a thing at Western. Uh, Anya, would you like to go? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, as Lori said, we're all part of, a lot of us are part of SSC. And so that was a huge part of my first year and then my second year as well. And another thing I really want to emphasize too is that like, of course, there are our lab experience in science, but you can also do it in other faculties as well if you reach out. And that was one thing I did this year that really impacted my year in an amazing way. Um, as a part of the Indigenous Health Lab, which is like community-based projects focused on um, Indigenous and communities and health. And that honestly really um, was a huge part of my year. And so I'd recommend if there's something else that you're interested in outside of science, you can also do that for sure. And then I was a part of a few um, other clubs like Crafting for a Cure and Charity Cords. And I would say like a big thing is just searching up on the USC website and just seeing what's out there because there are so many clubs. And um, I'm also starting another club um, next year. And so if you want to search your own and there's something that you don't, that you want to do and that's not there, you can always do that as well. So um, those are all the things that I was a part of this year. What club are you starting up next year, Anya? 
um, a kung fu club, so wushu. And um, I don't know if you guys have watched uh, like Marvel's Shang Chi, but um, like my teacher basically was like a part of choreographing it. So um, basically, we wanted to start something this year at, at Western, and yeah, it's gonna be really fun. That's really cool. That's really fascinating. All right, Maddie, would you like to go, please? Yeah, uh, unlike these other two lovely ladies, I focus more on like the academic side of things, but I hope I can convince you that it still is is fun being involved in academic clubs. Uh, so like these two mentioned, uh, I've been on SSC for, um, I'm going into my third year now as a VPA, but I've been a uh, second year medical science department rep and I've been a USC counselor. And the former of those roles is mainly just kind of representing uh, everybody that's in second year medical science, taking any concerns you see from your classmates uh, just to the broader social science council table or science council table uh, so that they can kind of be brought up to the deans of the department and things can kind of be dealt with. Uh, the latter of those roles being a USC counselor kind of meant that I liaise between uh, the bigger USC, which has uh, people sit on it from a bunch of the different faculties on campus, including some of the graduate ones. Uh, and so in that way, we kind of get to see uh, and perform advocacy on a broader scale. So we have external teams with, you know, London and uh, the Canadian government, and also with uh, Western's campus in general. So that was pretty cool to liaise between both of those. Uh, I'm also pretty heavily involved in my program. Uh, as I talked about before, I can't get enough of it. So uh, I'm on the biochemistry club as well. Um, and I think the biggest thing to note about those kind of um, academic opportunities is that they still are a really great way to meet people within your program that you don't get to connect with in class. And a good example of that has been uh, being in the biochem department. I've researched under a prof there too. Uh, and that hasn't been all work, no play. I've met some really awesome people in my lab group and we've gone out for drinks and stuff before. Uh, so I think no matter what your speed is, whether you're more of a sports person, uh, an advocacy person, or just like straight up academics, you just want to focus on it, there is 100% something for you at Western. It just kind of takes reaching out and tapping a couple of people on the shoulder and figuring out what they do. So I think that's a great takeaway is that there is literally something for just about everybody. Uh, Anish, do you want to wrap that one up for me? Yeah, sure. So I, I think everyone else has pretty much covered everything from like clubs week to like the academic side of things, science student council as well. I'm also part of science student council. Um, I think just the one little thing I want to add is that um, SOFs are also a really great resource in terms of like um, getting to know what's happening within the science community and science faculty and then what's happening in your residence as well. So like um, whatever residence you end up in and whatever floor you're in, there's like a resident SOF that kind of helps you through the whole process. They're kind of there for you. They provide you a lot of support and, and whatever you may need. And then you have like in the science faculty, you have like a science soft that's like a, assigned to you kind of, and they help you out in connecting you with a lot of resources on campus, whether it's within the faculty or even outside of it. So that I think is another great program where it's like um, you get access to kind of this, the resources that you may need. And like, it's kind of like a mentor figure that you can kind of look up to and kind of talk to um, if you need any help throughout the year. So softening is another great thing. That's great, thank you. So, I mean, it, it certainly sounds that you are all involved in lots of things. So um, one of the things we certainly hear from prospective students is that they're a little bit nervous maybe about getting involved and taking on lots of extracurriculars when um, they're starting at university. So do you have any advice on maybe how to balance academics with extracurriculars? Eden, or I'm sorry, Eden. Eden, did you want to begin with me? Me, well, good. Yeah, no, this is something that's really important to me um, because I think it's really important for like, especially students coming in to um, recognize that you're going to need, like, it's important to prioritize your own mental health and your own well-being as well and kind of like time block so that you aren't saying yes to everything and overburdening yourself. And I have, I struggle with saying yes to everything. So trust me, if you're that person, I get you. Um, what I'd recommend is um, especially at the beginning, definitely branch out and like there are going to be club fairs and then you'll have opportunities to kind of learn about all these new clubs and like even join mailing lists. But I would really encourage you to, to um, kind of pick and choose what you're most interested in to become involved in. I would probably recommend staying within like two to three clubs because I think anything more than that, not only are you not going to be as involved as you'd like to be in these clubs, but at some point it's all, you also don't want to overwhelm yourself because like during exam seasons and during midterm seasons, you are going to have to devote more time to your studies. Um, and although like clubs are cognizant of that, like it's, it's better from the get-go to kind of keep those things in mind when you're joining clubs and making commitments than to say yes and then be stuck in like so many commitments and also have to study. So yeah, I just kind of tell everyone to like heed the caution a little bit. <laughs> Good advice. Anya, would you like to, to go? Um, yeah, I completely agree um, with everything you said. Like, I think it's so important to manage your time and 
of course, like as soon as you get into university, you want to do all of these fun things and like clubs week is super fun and you get to see everything that's out there. And I think, yeah, just like stick to like two or three clubs that you really like. And then if you want to do more than that, then just kind of manage your time and see if you can do it. I think like it's really great to do leadership in all those clubs, but just stick to a few that you put a lot of your time into and then other ones you can do more recreationally. And um, like just because you don't go to every single event, that doesn't mean that like you're not part of the club. Like you can still just pick and choose what events you want to go to and, and what you like. And I think that is the most important thing when it comes to managing your time. That's a good thing to recognize is that you don't have to participate in every event that a, a club or a group is hosting. All right, Maddie, would you like to wrap it up for me? Yeah, I have two things to say to this point. Uh, the first is for uh, any of you that want to pursue any kind of professional school that might have like an extracurricular component or something like that. I say specifically med school just because that's kind of what I'm focused on, but you're going to be surrounded by uh, several students that think that in order to get into any of those places, um, they have to be committed to a wide variety of activities. And I think if you're somebody who's thought like that, I would caution you to reconsider a little bit and consider what Aiden had said, that if you're involved in two to three things really well and you're really passionate about them, number one, your time management isn't going to be as big of a problem because everything you're doing, you're really, really interested in. So you don't feel like you need breaks from those activities because those activities become your break. And medical schools or whatever professional school you're looking at are going to value higher quality experiences that you've had for longer that you can passionately talk about as opposed to having just a higher number of experiences because anybody can write their name on a number of lists and join a number of things, right? Uh, the second thing I would say, especially for uh, incoming first years like yourselves, is that everybody around you will be dealing with some level of feeling like they're drowning a little bit. And because it's a brand new environment, even if you took AP, IB, uh, different classes that claim to you know prep you for university everybody will enter the environment and feel a little bit swamped so I would say if you feel that feeling and you might second guess maybe joining a club or two I would say try to get comfortable with that feeling because that is very um pervasive throughout university but if you keep like keep on keeping on so to speak and you kind of deal with that you know feeling it becomes to get more comfortable and you'll know how to manage your time while also being able to do the things you want to do and succeeding in school because everybody feels like that trust me it subsides don't um ban yourself from all extracurriculars just because you feel like that at the beginning <laughs> that's some really great advice because that adjustment period is it's for real for sure all right, a uh, question for all of you. Um, why did you choose Western? Aiden, would you like to begin? Yes, I honestly love this question. Um, the biggest thing that drew me to Western was the community. Um, I had heard about it through like relatives and friends that I um, knew who had um, attended Western. And um, one of the things, like the biggest thing that made me choose Western, aside from the amazing medical sciences program, of course, was the fact that I knew that there would be a sense of community here and that it would be easy to kind of lean on friends, peers, whoever, classmates, um, when you needed support. And I have not been more correct about that. If I, to toot my own horn, that is the, the best decision I've made is coming to Western because um, like t every time I've needed help, there has been someone to to lean on and like my friends have been there for me and I've made some of my closest friends who I talk to on a daily basis because of um, coming to Western. So I'll just put it that, put that on the table. <laughs> I love it. I love hearing these answers. Emily, would you like to go? Yeah, I mean, obviously I echo everything that Aiden said. I think for me, the biggest thing that I loved about not only Western, but also like this program is the flexibility you have to really customize your degree to what interests you. I mean, I there weren't very many um, people in my class who could say they did a minor in dance as well, but that was just something that I was really passionate about. And I don't think I could have gotten that anywhere else to be able to do, you know, really in-depth medical science studying as well as dance. It's kind of, it's not done very often. And it's something that I know that it changed my life. And it's something that I value tremendously. And I think having that freedom makes you really invested in what you're studying. When you're passionate about what you're learning, it's all the more enjoyable for you and you're going to do all the better. So having that flexibility is something that I think Western does really, really well. And I value, and I know a lot of other students do as well. I think you're the only student that I know of that's done dance and med sci. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic combination. Um, Anya, would you like to go? Yeah, so I think I'm echoing everything everybody else said, but um, one new thing is that 
I really wanted to have a good work-life balance. And I think like coming to Western was a great option because of course, like academics are amazing. Our program is super specialized as Emily said, and that's really great. And then also there's the other aspect of like clubs and, and community and, and all these other things that are really, really great that I think um, maybe is not just unique to Western, but there are so many niches within it that are definitely unique to Western. I think like we have the best soft program. Like I can definitely say that because when I came to Western, I felt so included in everything. And, and that's just an amazing uh, feeling to have. And so that's why I came to Western and I was definitely right in that aspect for sure. We hear the Western community is such a big draw for everyone. So I really love that you're highlighting that and that was your experiences as well. Uh, Sam Darsh. Yeah, so a large reason why I chose Western was um, well, partially because my brother went to Queens, so obviously I had to go to Western. But then also, also just the fact that it's kind of like a perfect distance away from my hometown, like an hour, 40 minute drive away from Mississauga, which makes it far enough that you can have your own life and kind of grow up and kind of like, you know, become an adult over the years, a functioning adult. And also the fact that, you know, once you're here, you kind of realize that there's like a large student leadership and it's really easy to get involved too. So it kind of really scoops you in and makes you part of its community. And so, yeah, Western just kind of grows on you. And over the summer, you kind of like have a, an urge to kind of go back and spend some days there. All right, Anish, would you like to go, please? Yeah, sure. So yeah, kind of just echoing what everyone else has said. I think the work-life balance is great. Um, the sense of community is all really great. Like. Um, the residence I was in, like, I kind of touched on that before, like, um, I got to meet so many people there. So it's like, um, you really have that great balance between everything. And then, of course, like the med side program itself, like the opportunities that you get, the different kinds of courses and specializations that you have in third year, like, all of those mixed together is kind of why I chose Western. It, it like, so pri primarily came down to, like, what I liked about the program and, like, everything outside of the program as well. So the social life and the, um, and the balance between everything. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Okay, my last question for you. What advice would you give to your first yourself? Lori, you were very quick with that. <laughs> All right, would you like to, yeah. get, to begin? <laughs> um, yeah, so I would tell myself in first year, you know, and th this is just how it's always going to be for regardless for any university, it's going to be tough. It, it's going to be tough studying science in first year. Um, it's a big jump from high school, no matter how well you did in high school, it, regardless, it's going to be tough and that's okay. Um, you're gonna have times where you really struggle. There are gonna be times also where you feel like it's really rewarding, but regardless of that, you'll be able to pull through. Hundreds of students do it every year. So you can definitely, and you can really find those rewarding things from your experiences. I know I struggled in first year and I still continue to struggle even now. You know, it doesn't necessarily get easier, but I know that in my program, I've met so many amazing people to not only support me and help me with the academic side, but also the mental health side or going and trying new things with clubs. And the fact that the community here is not only just friendly and supportive, but full of so many like-minded people. I mean, just look at this call alone. Everyone here is so focused on what they love and their program. And, um, and they, they find excellence in so many different avenues, whether that's in whatever postgraduate program you do or any job or anything you search outside of your experience at Western, I, I was shocked, honestly, the fact that in my first year, I met so many different people that were so excellent and amazing at in every single avenue, both academic and, and social. And so I, I would just tell myself in first year to try to just take that leap of faith and go in and just try your best, give it your all. Don't give up if things get hard, which it's going to, just keep trying and reach out for help. Don't do it alone. You know, reach out to your classmates because I guarantee you they are struggling just as much as you are. They are they are fighting their own struggles. And I, I guarantee that if you reach out to them, they'll be more than happy to help you and then also get some help themselves. Um, and so I would just tell all of you to just, you know, stay in there and just, just keep going through it. That's really good advice. That is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Aiden. Yeah, so I always, whenever anyone asks for advice, this is the number one thing that I'll tell them. And I think it applies to like every facet of life. Um, and my advice is um, to not compare yourself to others. Um, and I know that a lot of the time, I, this is probably something that's overlooked or people don't really think much about it, but I think it's super important to consider that like each one of us, even in this call, have unique circumstances that we don't know of, of each other's, in each other's lives, um, in each other's upbringings. 
um, life circumstances, like personal life, academics as well. And so it's important to not, like, I think it's really easy to sometimes get wrapped up in the whole thing of, oh, well, so-and-so did this. Maybe I should also take on that commitment or I should also be achieving so-and-so or I should also be getting as high a mark as this. But a lot of the times we forget to consider that our circumstances are different and that everyone excels in different things. And so it's not fair to yourself to compare yourself to others and then constantly feel inadequate for doing so. And so my advice, again, is to not compare yourself to others. And I think if you kind of internalize that, you'll go far. <laughs> I think it's a good reminder to be kind to yourself for sure. Uh, Maddie, please. Yeah, um, I think I have two things. One's more academic focus and then one's more for my science friends and you know, getting out there and having social life. Uh, so the first academic thing is kind of building off of what Aiden said and that's um, the comparative bit. But I think if you're somebody like me who came from a high school where you didn't have AP courses and you didn't have IB courses, you're going to be surrounded by a lot of students who are talking very heavily about what they did in high school that they feel prepped them for university. And in the first couple of weeks, especially, it's going to feel like everybody has some experience, some program or some older sibling even that has prepped them so much better than you to come into university. And I think if you ever hear your, like your inner voice telling yourself that, um, just take a deep breath and just remind yourself that you can do well. It is possible to do well in your first and subsequent years of university, even if you don't have any of those kind of above and beyond experiences. Uh, and I think it really just comes down to how um, how well you want to succeed. I mean, if you want to, you know, put in the work and go to classes and show up for yourself every day, it is 100% possible to do well, even without coming from those kinds of backgrounds. That's kind of the academic thing, I would say. Uh, the social side of things. Um, if you're also like me and you kind of came from a high school where not many kids went on to pursue uh, a STEM or like a medical related uh, field, you might have felt a little bit out of place in your high school and you had friends, but they probably weren't the type that really you drive with. You're going to come into your first year and realize, like Lori said, that you're around so many like-minded people, not only in the type of academic things that you like, but also just in the worldviews that you have. And you're even going to meet some people who have grown up differently than you that are going to teach you so much about the world and how to just be a better friend that the relationships you build here in science and with people not even in your faculty are going to shock you at how deep and how awesome they can be. So just keep yourself open to that and keep yourself open to relationships that come from a variety of sources and just keep hanging in there. Like Lori said, the academics will come, even if it's not in the first week. You're giving me all the feels, y'all. All right. Sorry, Anna, if I could... like to... Oh, sorry. Sorry. I just wanted to add something to Maddie's, yeah. uh, what she just said, because she just reminded me, popped in my head. Um, mm -hmm. What she said also about doing well in general, you can also finish and do well, even if you reach a little bit of a bump, even if you don't do well in some, in something or somewhere along the line in your course, I guarantee you, you will be able to, to do well at the end if you keep pushing through. So just wanted to kind of backpack off of what Maddie was saying. No, that's great. I appreciate that. Um, uh, sorry, where was I? Anya, would you like to go? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I already mentioned this before, but I think balance is a huge key part of like just continuing through university because I think like in high school, I was so hung up with school and I was super uptight and I just really wanted to do well in all my classes. And, and I think like coming into university, I thought I could just use the same mentality, but I think like you have to approach things differently when you come into university because there's more content, there's harder classes and it's like, it's hard to keep up. And, and so one thing I would say is just to relax um, that like you will get through it. I think all the advice that everyone said is just so crucial and just listen to that. And um, also listen to your body. Like I think I was trying to like push myself way too much and like make sure you eat well. I think like often like sometimes people just forget to eat. Like that was me. Like I would skip a meals and do things like that. And you cannot do that because that is the only way you're going to get through your classes is if you eat properly, if you sleep properly. And also to not let go of your hobbies because I think one thing that everyone looks back on is like, it's not just like the academics, but it's also like the other parts of life that, I don't know, make you who you are. Like, don't lose that because that's what makes you you. And I think like it's so important to keep to keep going. And um, that's one thing like you don't want to regret. I don't know, not like, I don't know if you paint, if you sing, if you like play the piano, like just try to keep up with it because you're really going to be grateful for that, like when you get older. And so that's my advice. And if you're like Emily, you can build your degree around it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your answers. Now, students, I'm going to ask you to keep your video on, and I would like to ask uh, Drs. Urquhart, Dr. smith Perriard, and Jen Chambers, who is our BMS UE coordinator for interdisciplinary studies, to also turn their videos on. I know that there has been a whole slew of questions being asked throughout the night, 
And I would like to use the last few minutes to answer some of those questions live. Um, so we've got a few compiled in the chat. Um, my first one is, and if you just want to raise your hand or just jump in, um, have at it. Uh, the first one is, what is the largest class in medical science? And what are the ways that a student can get support from the faculty in their course? Not sure who wants to take that one. I, I can take a stab at at, uh, at that one. So so the the largest and, and maybe I'll I'll ask the students if they have any um, any thoughts on on the supports because they're the ones that have definitely uh, gone through it. But the largest class I think by far that students experience in in medical science is biochemistry twenty two eighty in the second year. Two sections, you know, probably six hundred or so students at least in each section. I think we actually already heard about one of the instructors and how great the, the instructor is, Dr. McLaughlin, earlier from one of the, the students. But students, do you want to, does anyone want to talk about your experiences with Biochem 2280? Thanks, Maddie. Yeah, you uh, probably knew the Biochem kid was going to have something to say about this class. Um, yeah, so this course is kind of my intro into um, being in my program, like I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, as was said before, this is a pretty big class. Now, um, given I did take it in an online environment, but somehow being online, the courses feel even bigger because the office hours are just overwhelmingly big. Uh, but when you take this course, hopefully in person next year, if all things go to well or go to plan, touch wood, um, you'll find that because of the quality of instructors that are teaching the course, it's not difficult to get support should you reach out for it. So I know Dr. McLaughlin and Dr. Bofa, uh, my mind is slipping on the third professor that instructs that course, but uh, all three of those professors are uh, each teach their own section and they're specialists in that section and have oftentimes done research in the specific thing they're teaching you. So they do a really good job of trying to make a really big course feel accessible, especially when it's one that all second year medical science kids have to take, even if it's not something you need further down the line. Like my uh, phys and One Health friends in the call probably will never have to take a biochem course again in their life, but they do a really good job of making the course accessible to everybody, given the large size that it is, because that could be a challenge, but they do it very well. Fantastic. I think that's something we hear a lot about is, is what is my biggest class? And like, I've never had to take a class with 300, 500, 600, 800 students. So thank you for, for answering that for me. Um, this one's actually for the students specifically. Uh, what are your thoughts on first year physics? And if a student didn't take high school physics, will it be tough to catch up on? Uh, Lori, do you wanna begin? Yeah, so I was exactly in that position two years ago. And I can tell you right now that you will get through it. I went into first year and it, you know, it was tough. I, I didn't really have that background, but like I said before, you kind of adjust as you go. I mean, no matter what, even if you have a background in any of the subjects, you're gonna have to adjust because it's a totally different learning experience, totally different studying method. Everything will change anyways. So it, it kind of that first a couple months or so is learning for yourself what works best for you, how to be efficient, how to truly learn. And I think in my first semester, that's kind of what I, what I did. I was like, okay, I'm not really sure how to really master physics, how to actually get through the concepts into my head and be able to solve a new problem. But then come second semester, after I had that experience and kind of pushed through it, in second, second semester, I did so much better and I enjoyed it so much more. I truly learned how to actually tackle those problems and figure out how to get those concepts into my head, integrate it into my studying. And so I guarantee you, you can catch up. It's going to be tough as all the other courses are going to be, but that shouldn't scare you away because it is definitely doable. It's so much fun, actually. Um, and with, with every new course you're going to take, you're going to go through a similar, uh, at first, learning curve, and then you're going to attach that to every other aspect of your studying and immediately become a better student overall. And so I think that should motivate you to, to learn something new and um, kind of expand yourself in the science realm. Fantastic. Emily, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think I've heard this question a lot. And as someone who didn't take grade 12 physics, you can do it and you can make it through med sci. <laughs> I, I've done it myself. Um, I think kind of echoing what Laurie said, the learning curve will be there, but the professors do a fantastic job of really easing you into the course. It's not like day one, you're already feeling swamped. You might feel a little intimidated, but they do a really great job of, you know, touching on the basics, 
reviewing what you might have covered in high school and then building off of it in a way that makes sense. So it actually kind of comes intuitively when you go back and you're studying it. And I think just a little point on studying that I learned, especially with physics, is that the if you're a kind of person who likes to study where you just copy out your notes over and over and over again, physics is a great class to start practicing applying what you're learning. I think just copying down your notes unfortunately likely won't work. Um, you're going to need to do a little bit, a little bit more, tweak that a little bit. And I think all the different practice exercises that your professors walk you through in class and then give you additional ones to try outside of class. Those are fantastic practice opportunities for, you know, your quizzes and then your exam down the line and also help you learn how to study effectively for physics and for other courses. I think it's also key to remember that you can also go ask for office hours and speak to your profs too if there's a concept that you don't understand. Uh, Sam Darsh, do you want to also answer that? Yeah, basically just uh, just reflecting what everybody else said. Um, I, I didn't take physics in grade 12 either, but the way that they kind of structure physics is very nice in that they provide you a lot of practice questions to be able to apply like what you're learning and they kind of build that into the course so it, it, it forces you to keep up and also it's just that they have such great supports academically so besides aside from the office hours that the course itself offers the students themselves like the upper year uh fourth year students in part of the physics and astronomy club would host hours where you could go in and get help from a student so they have a lot of you know people that are rooting for you and making sure that you that you do the best that you possibly can it's all about just getting out there and just using those resources and you'll be absolutely fine if you don't take physics in grade 12. all right thank you um all right another question for the students you guys are popular tonight um i'm guessing most of you are now living off campus so how do you commute to your classes and other places? How good is our transit system? Uh, how do you manage the, the long distance between residents and buildings during the winter? Uh, what works for you? I know that's a multi-part question, so if I have to break it down, I can, I can definitely do that. But uh, Sam Darsh, you look like you had your hand up first. Do you wanna start? Yeah, for sure. So I live on the south side of uh, campus near, near the McDonald's that everybody says. Um, it's, I, I transit to campus using the busing system. It's actually pretty efficient. So when you arrive at Western, they give you a student card that you kind of keep with you. And that also serves as your bus pass. So you just tap on and you can go pretty much anywhere. Um, and the, and the busing system is pretty efficient. Like during the week, I don't even have to ch check the bus times. I can just walk to a bus stop and be sure that in five minutes, the bus will come. Um, it's just in the winters, make sure you dress warm and avoid the geese at the bus stop because they will, and they can, they will attack you. So it's just always, you know, just, just keep mind of that. Oh, the geese. <laughs> they had to make it into the presentation somehow, hey? Uh, Anya, would you like to go? Yeah, sure. So I live like really close to Masonville Mall, which is kind of far from campus. But honestly, like what's really helped me out is just like knowing the bus system. And like, I think you'll kind of get used to it. Like, you'll know, like there's the standard buses that you take, like to get to campus and then also to leave. And so I think like it gets easier, like after a while, like I was so scared because I'd never like gone on like a bus before, before I came to Western. And so like, I think like it's really easy to like to learn. And then another thing is like, I guess just make sure you like have like an umbrella or have like boots and stuff because I think it does get kind of like in London it does get pretty muddy sometimes especially like because like of course there's geese around and there's like you know stuff lying around on the on the sides of campus all the time so I think just bring boots when it gets wet but um yeah like I think that's my best advice. So dress appropriately dress for all four seasons. Emily, would you like to go? Yeah, I think I have a kind of a different take just because I've worked with the off-campus housing office for the past three years. So that's a great resource that students have if they are choosing to live off campus. Um, after first year, you can use their website and search how close you want to be to campus. Um, they also have great tips on, you know, being aware of what bus stops are near you. Um, using different apps to track bus times or, you know, garbage schedules. So they kind of also help you. It's really weird. London has an eight-day garbage schedule, which for me was 
an adjustment, but <laughs> that app came uh, in clutch <laughs> quite often. But um, that's just another resource that Western offers where, you know, they're here to support you, not just in first year, but all the way through your academic career, um, even living off campus. So that's definitely something I'd recommend people check out. That's, that's great advice. Maddie, would you like to go? Yeah, I think I'll touch on the latter part of the question, just because I think the off-campus housing situation has been covered pretty well. Um, so as far as getting like transit between your residence buildings and your classes, uh, on your timetable, when you actually do make your schedule, you'll see that usually you have uh, what looks like hour-long time blocks. And at first, when I came in, I thought, how am I supposed to miraculously be at North Campus Building in one second and then be at the Spencer Engineering Building uh, by the very next minute? Uh, but your first class that you have will always end at um, 10 minutes before like the half hour. So if you have a class that starts at 8.30, it won't actually end at 9.30, it'll end at 9.20. And every instructor pretty much follows this to the T with a couple like, you know, exceptions here or there. Uh, so this 10 minutes should be more than enough for you to get to uh, any classes. And profs are really, really understanding for the entire first month of class about getting giving you that time to get between classes. And I've even had a couple scenarios where maybe I'm working in a lab and I might run into when my class time starts. And if this is gonna be kind of a recurring thing for you, every professor that I've approached has been super accommodating when I've said, hey, just so you know, I might have to sneak in the back a little bit later when this class starts. All of them have been super awesome about it because they know you're not doing it you know, to be lazy and not show up to class on time. They do, they know that we're busy. So uh, I would say if transit between classes during the day, in the morning, uh, what have you, is a concern of yours, rest assured the 10 minutes is there and profs are really understanding if you need anything more than the 10 minutes, but try your best to show up to class on time. They like that. And it sounds like take the initiative and have the conversation with the prof to let them know that you might be late is a good option. For sure, okay. Next one for the students, because you guys are just so popular tonight. What is your favorite and also least favorite thing about each of your specialties? Uh, Maddie, you want to start? You had your hand up pretty quickly. Yes, sorry. Uh, again, anytime I can uh, push biochem and micro, I'll do it. Um, so I would say my favorite thing about the program is definitely um, the real life applicable skills that you get from the program that extend beyond biochemistry and uh, immunology. So I initially went into it because the courses and the discipline sounded interesting to me, but I ended up realizing it doesn't matter if let's say I, you know, fingers crossed, get into medical school and I never really actually use my undergrad degree but I will use the things that I've picked up in those classes in every single endeavor that I have from this point on. Um, the level of critical thinking, I cannot stress enough that you develop from this module is uh, second to none. Uh, I think a lot of medical science students, because we have to you know, achieve such high grades, we like to think that we have really good critical thinking skills, but you really, really don't truly develop those skills until you get into a course and a program that is on the more difficult side that really makes you stretch your brain and have to collaborate with other students and have to figure out problems that the profs aren't just going to give you the answer for if you beg hard enough. Uh, so I think that's the main thing that I really like about the program is that it challenges you in a doable way and leaves you with skills that you'll take in whatever you do. Um, the least favorite thing that I would maybe say um, is probably the reputation that the program has. For some reason, biochemistry has this really bad reputation as being unreasonably difficult. And as somebody who's currently been in the program and been become friends with a lot of people in the program, that's simply not the case. It just takes a different type of work than maybe you're used to. Um, and granted, maybe another least favorite part is some of the courses can be challenging at first. They're definitely doable. So I'd say least favorite part, the way that it's for some reason marketed uh, sometimes makes it seem like it's unreasonably difficult. And that's not what the department's doing. I think that's just the students doing that have been in the program before, but I'm here to set the record straight. It is a great program. It's a great module. It's not overly difficult. So. so really all the takeaway here is all of our participants should be doing biochem. Oh, hundred percent. That's what, that's why okay. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Would anybody else like to add to that? All right. Um, so I'm going to move on to my next question. This isn't just be actually just a quick show of hands. Um, we've already talked a little bit about balancing extracurriculars with academics. So I'm just curious how many of you are also in holding a part-time job? Just one of you, two of you. Oh, two of you, okay, fantastic. Do you find that outside of the balance that we spoke about a little bit earlier on, any challenges or anything like that that you wanna highlight? 
Um, one thing I think I would say is, especially with part-time jobs that are on campus or like linked to Western, they're really understanding that you are a student first and foremost. So if that means, you know, for my job, we weren't scheduled as frequently during exam times, or we could request a certain week off if we knew that was a really, really hectic week. Um, our managers were always really okay with us switching shifts, um, even just coming to them and saying, hey, I have this last minute project. You know, hopefully it's not last minute, but <laughs> um, they were very accommodating and understanding. So I think that's also a huge plus of working on campus if possible. Um, and you also get to work with other students. So that's always a great time. There's a lot of really cool jobs on campus that you can have too. Tour guiding in our office is one of them and you get to show off Western's campus and the geese. You get to avoid the geese, but show the geese. Um, last question that I'm gonna ask for our students tonight. Um, if you had to choose, cause I think uh, what I heard was this is a new option. So if you had the choice to do the second half of physics or the newly introduced computer science course, um, which do you think would be more helpful to your degree and to your research opportunities? And I, you had your hand up really quickly there, so I'll let you begin. For me personally, and obviously this will depend on your module and your circumstances, I think I would have benefited from having the option because I would have taken the computer science as opposed to the second half of physics, because that would have been very um, useful for me. Like half of my honor specialization is biostatistics, and a lot of what we do there is like statistical analysis, and we use a lot of software, so stuff like RStudio, SAS, Stata, and all of these are um, like in, any computer science knowledge would be beneficial for this, and that's something that I didn't have going in. It didn't obviously stop me from pursuing the honor specialization, but it certainly would have helped me <laughs> if I had some prior experience. Okay, fantastic. Lori, would you like to go? Yeah, um, so I will just start off by saying that regardless of what you choose, you will end up getting some experience in the MedSci module in coding and in programming because in our uh, statistics for the sciences course, you will deal with um, our programming, which is like a statistical software. Um, and that's mainly used for like in, in life science applications mainly, or it's like a, a more simple quote unquote uh, coding program. And so I would still choose physics. Um, just because I really just enjoyed the content. It, it had a lot more, I, I thought personally, physiological um, applications to the physics content. We did fluids, which is like, you know, your, your entire body system is composed of fluids. Uh, we did electrostatic magnetism, which I really loved. I, I thought it was so much better than first semester physics. However, um, I will say computer science and coding is something, it's a skill that you can develop all throughout. And so I wouldn't stress much if you are maybe interested in taking just the physics for the content and maybe you're worried about the about learning coding because while it would be beneficial for sure, coding is, it, I mean, even just the programs itself, there are so many that it's a skill that you'll have to develop throughout whatever course or whatever project you're working on. And it's definitely doable with all the resources online or with other people who have been in those courses or, or have experience. So I think it really just it depends on your interest really in first year, because I think in first year, regardless, both courses will give you um, adequate skills for anything you pursue in the future. Fantastic. Well, everyone, that is all of the time that we have today. So I want to say a huge thank you to all of our students and staff and presenters. I know that if we were in person, we'd be able to do a huge round of applause for all of your input and advice and anecdotes and vulnerability. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I also want to say a huge thank you to all of our participants because we wouldn't be here tonight having these conversations without you. Uh, I do hope that you got all of the information that you need. I still see a few questions coming in on the chat, so we'll stay on a bit to answer the rest of those questions. But in the meantime, I want to wish you all the best of luck on your journey to university and that you have a wonderful rest to your evening. So thank you.